Welcome everybody, welcome to part 8 of 11 of the Legendarium's Silmarillion read-along. Today we are covering a couple of chapters, chapters 20 and 21, I believe. Uh, so this is um, of the fifth battle, and Kyle, yes, I am going to make you pronounce that a little bit later. And we're also going to talk about Turin Turambar. That'll probably be the main feature of this episode when we get to Turin, um, well, just because it is a packed chapter, much like Baron and Luthien. Um, it's one of those kind of standalone chapters in the book. Uh, but we all, all are also going to talk about the fifth battle. This is one of the fan favorite chapters. Everybody loves talking about chapter 20. Um, all right, and everybody loves reading chapter 20. Uh, it's a very cool, very interesting battle scene. So we'll get there as well. Uh, but before we do, let me just remind everybody. <clears throat> well, I guess before I remind anybody of anything, I'll tell you, I'm Craig, your host. Uh, over there, he's Kyle. Hi, Kyle. What's up? Ryan, hello. Good day to you all. Yes, apparently. Well, we are... well met. Yes. <laughs> but that's the thing. We're not. We're not well met. We're not met in any capacity because we are recording this um, uh, over the interwebs today uh, because of a possible but maybe negative COVID thing. And apparently... we're like, you know... Things don't stay in Vegas because that's where I was and I came back <laughs> and I I was sick and we had a bunch of people I was with tested positive for COVID. So that's why we're playing we're playing it safe right now. So Yes, there you go. All right. So <laughs> you tested positive for something else you got in Vegas, Ryan. It wasn't COVID. That but test we, has another week we'll before we can it. come back. They have to culture that before we can does, does it burn when you sneeze or burn when you never mind. Uh, uh, when I do both at the same time, everything burns. <laughs> All right, so uh, welcome, guys. Um, let's see. Okay, now I can remind everybody to go to thelegendarium.com. Go check out uh, our Patreon link if, you, if you'd like to support us. I, I, uh, I would say now that we're eight episodes into our Silmarillion read-through, if you've been enjoying this, if you enjoy um, all, you know, us skipping all over all sorts of important stuff, if you enjoy us going off on tangents, and having a good time with the Silmarillion, then I hope that you'll go to Patreon and support the show. Kick in a buck. We'd really, really appreciate it. It uh, goes a long way to making us, you know, want to keep making these episodes. So, uh, so yeah, please go do that if you've enjoyed this. You can also go check out prior episodes. We've got almost 400 now in the can that people can go check out in our archive. Um, and you can also find the link to Discord where you can join the conversation and join in with I want to say it's about 1,200 other massive nerds now uh, on Discord. So I hope people will go do that, join that conversation on Discord. Okay, guys, uh, I almost said Baron and Luthien, but uh, no, tour into Rambar. Let me ask you this. Um, as we get started, um, and no, I'm not going to do a recap because as we were talking kind of in the virtual green room beforehand, there is no recapping this. It, the idea of doing a three paragraph recap is foolhardy at best. So let me just start with the question that I've asked you uh, in a few episodes here is, did you enjoy it? The, so, okay. So let me, let me prep that by saying we've had a lot of um, setup chapters, you know, a lot of like mythical kind of, you know, world creation, that sort of thing. Like so, some really, some really uh, mythical stuff. And then we got to Baron and Luthien, and that was like, oh my gosh, it's an actual contained fairy tale with a beginning, middle, and end. This is so interesting within the Silmarillion. Um, and now we have kind of another bit of that with Turin Turambar. And the difference is that this is the least happy story maybe ever. <laughs> uh, so it's like the anti-fairy tale in a way. How did you guys respond to it? How did you enjoy it? Um, Kyle, let's start with you. How'd it go? Oh, I feel like that's a loaded question because there was so much in both of these chapters. It's it was I, I was actually kind of cursing your schedule at first when after I got through with this because like Craig, there's so much that just happened. <laughs> it's a different it's a different feel from I think previous chapters where it's like I just read so much and nothing felt like it happened because it was just names and genealogy and setup and whatever where this one, I feel like there was so much in here, but there were so like small little clips of a million different, just super metal 
super cool things that when I got done, I was kind of like, what the hell did I just read? <laughs> <laughs> um, the battle with the dragons and you've basically got like the revenge of Ong Bond and stuff like that. And then you've got Turin, who's just the most miserable, I said, miserable, maybe not the right word, but I felt miserable reading all the, like the dude accidentally kills how many people that he shouldn't be killing. And just like, felt like every story we got to is like, and then so-and-so jumped out of the woods and Turin killed him on accident. Cause he didn't know who he was, you know, like, Anyways, I felt like there was a lot of fun stuff, um, but it was it was kind of sad. <laughs> so that's I don't know. That's kind of my recap, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's that's perfectly legit, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so I I had a differing response actually to these two different chapters because um, we have the the uh, the fifth battle sequence or whatever uh which right right do you want to try uh pronouncing that first uh, oh gosh nirnaeth arnoediad hey that was actually pretty damn good I that was really good that. i thought you were going to pronounce the fifth battle and i was just going to say <laughs> this, the second t is silent ryan <laughs> Uh, I should have. I wish. I wish my wit had been on on sharp enough to do that. But no, that that was legit good. I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, yeah. So we had that the this opening this sequence here, which it felt very epic, but it felt very much in, uh, I guess, in line and in tone with what else I've read in the Silmarillion, where it had a little more action feel, but it was still it was more history based. Uh, mm-hmm. Baron and Luthien was the first time I really feel like we jumped away from that and got m- uh, more narrative than history. Uh, this time I was like, oh, we're citing back just a little bit. It's still narrative. It's still, there's still some there, but, uh, we're still in that. And then we went to Turin and Turin Bar and it was straight back to what we got in Baron and Luthien where it was this, I, I feel like you could easily have gone through and been like, uh, if this were written today, it would be a serialized small novel thing, something a little bit more mm-hmm. like Dresden files or something like that, where it's a little more serialized, I guess. Um, it was very episodic for yeah. sure. Mm. I kept picturing it as a, like a mini series or something. Episode one, Turin does this. Ep- ep- f- season finale, he impregnates his sister and they kill each other. Or they kill themselves. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, yeah. I actually had that thought, not that exact thought, but I thought along those lines. <laughs> I was like, I wonder how hard it would be to adapt just the Turin Turin Bar story to a different medium to showcase it as, as we like, I know Amazon's doing all of their uh, second age stuff, but you know, is this a, would this be a good story to consider telling in another's in a, in a small eight episode mini series type setup? Huh. Cool. Let's come back to that. The, the <laughs> possibility of adaptation. I'm serious. Remember that I, I want to come back to it. Um, but let me go back to something else you said, Ryan. If we can zoom, uh, if we can uh, go back to chapter 20 uh, of the fifth battle, Nirnaeth Arnoediad. Very nicely done, Ryan. Um, Gazoon tight. Thank you. Um, what was I, oh, you, you said, Ryan, that when, okay, so we get done with Baron and Luthien and we get to the fifth battle and you're like, ah, you know, there's, there's, some, you know, there's some narrative stuff. Uh, but mostly it's zoomed out. It's like historical. It kind of feels that way. Mm-hmm. I would submit to you that it is not. There is no narrative, you know, it, like there's no story structure the way that we think of it, like that we've gotten in Baron and Luthien, that we get in Turin Turambar. That doesn't exist in the fifth battle. But the difference is that you read through Baron and Luthien, having read 15 or so chapters beforehand, um, or what is it, 18 chapters, I guess it is, whatever it is, um, you read all those chapters and you got to know Beleriand. You got to know the elves. You got to know the houses. Even if you don't have the family trees memorized, I don't. Um, you, But you at least, you've heard the names. You're kind of, you get the broad brushstrokes of what's going on in this world and who's allied with whom. And, um, you know, and, and the idea that, you know, all is quiet on the Northern front, but not for long. So you get all of that. And so when you're reading chapter 20, having gone through 18 other chapters of that type of um, storytelling, that sort of history telling, then it it can feel maybe a little bit more narrative. You feel more involved in the story, even though you're still zoomed out to a 30,000 foot view. 
you can feel more involved in the way that you would in a regular, quote unquote, regular narrative because of that experience. Thoughts and feelings, Ryan. I can see that. I can see that being a possibility there. Um, Because there is... There is a certain level of payoff to the bubbling up north that's been going on that we hear just you know, to, to having this this be a payoff to a lot of what we've read before. So I guess that makes sense um, and why it would feel a little more narrative, even though it may not be. But uh, I don't know. I guess it, the, sh- <laughs> the shortest way to put this is there's some pretty amazing stuff that happens in there and it made me really excited. And maybe that just made me think it was narrative. <laughs> right. Yeah. Kyle, do you have any thoughts on that? Or shall we move on? Uh, we can move on. Well, I have thoughts on the the chapter. I please appreciate. Go, go I appreciated that there was they did not win. I appreciate mm. there was no real victory. Um, well, I, I should say that the Morgoth's forces essentially won this battle, right? Um, because I was expecting there to be some sort of like win for the light side. I don't know why, but. I really appreciate that. Like you said, when we look at the whole, because the whole thing is the whole story. Like we, we've talked about this on the previous episode where we're saying you zoom out. This is all one big giant story. And I like that there's these seasons of doom, if you will, where it's like we just got our asses kicked and now what's going to happen. Right. So I, I appreciated that. Yeah. There's a, a couple of things on that note. Um, we're, we're reading... Um, we're reading Tolkien at, like in the full flower of his obsession with Norse mythology. You know, the, uh, like the northern stories, um, the prose and the poetic eddas and all that stuff. And that's, by the way, that's where this is drawn from. A lot of the inspiration for Turin and Turambar came from the story of Kulervo, uh, which we're not really going to get into, but we will acknowledge, yes, if you, if you enjoyed the story, if you thought it was interesting, if you thought it was worthwhile go read the story of Calervo um, from the Eddas and uh, have a great time with that one. Because <laughs> it's, if anything, I don't know, maybe darker? I don't know, maybe it's not. Tolkien was pretty dark with this one. But anyway, so he loves all this Norse stuff. Um, and one of the things that people love pointing out, and I'm one of them, I, I, I find this aspect fascinating, this idea that, um, that Norse mythology, as we understand it, um, kind of points us toward Ragnarok, t- points us toward this final battle. Uh, and the weird thing is, from our perspective, um, as kind of Western readers, the weird thing about Ragnarok is that the good guys are destined to lose. And yet, they're going to fight anyway. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, it's the right thing to do. I'm brave. I, you know, I'm willing to give my life for this cause. Whatever it is, um, they're destined to lose. And so as we go through Middle Earth, and now as you know, we've had thousands of years of history in the Silmarillion, and we're going to have thousands of years more all the way up through the end of uh, the Lord of the Rings. Um, that is a dominant theme is like, things don't go well. Yes, there are battles that are won, there are wars that are won, but ultimately, things aren't going well. And then because of that, I think we have to bring in Tolkien's other love, Okay, so he loves Norse mythology and that kind of like pagan aesthetic. But his other greater love was his Catholicism. And we have to talk about that because ultimately, like Middle Earth is not grimdark, right? This is, this is not, we're not reading a story, like this isn't Hamlet where all the bad, or all, all the good guys, all the bad guys, everybody dies and then the story ends. You know, this isn't that. There is he always maintains that kind of optimistic tone throughout all of his stories. I, I think that's fair. And that's because he's kind of, tri- I, I, at least the way I read it, he's marrying his uh, Nordic obsession with his uh, Catholic um, love. And so it's like the world is going to hell in a handbasket in the long term. It always, everything is going down, but Christ will come and save everything, right? So that's, Um, Anyway, I think um, the story of Turin really fits well within that kind of in a a microcosm where it's like, here's this guy, he is um, quote unquote cursed, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, he's cursed, he's always making the wrong decision, he's always stepping in it, so to speak, 
Um, but in the end, he is yeah, someone of, um, at least he tries to be someone of good character. Uh, he tries to be somebody who's l true and loyal to his friends and, you know, his, uh, well, <laughs> to his protectors, to whoever. Um, and it is mentioned uh, that he will join with the rest of the heroes in the, the, the final battle at the end of the world or whatever. Like, Turin is one of the heroes of Middle-earth, even though this is the darkest possible story you could ever imagine, right? Um, so anyway, I feel like I just talked for about five minutes straight. I have no idea what about. I like I kind of blacked out there for a second. Uh, but uh, I, I got Ryan to nod a couple of times, so I feel good about it. Hey, it was a good transition for into Turin Turambar off of the fifth battle setup. So it was good. <laughs> that's that's right. That, that was all on purpose. Totally. Absolutely on purpose. Um, I, is there, so Kyle or Ryan, is there anything else from the fifth battle that you want to talk about other than the fact that it's the most metal thing of all time? I just, uh, if there's one piece to take out of that going in, specifically if your focus is on Turan Turam, uh, Turin Turambar, uh, it's his, his father, correct? Huron, uh, mm -hmm. Huron, yep. Huron, yeah. Uh, kind of, you get a little bit of what happens to him. Because he comes back at the end of the story. I feel like he comes in, like, he transitions from the end of the fifth battle where he's just been beaten terribly. And then he comes back at the very end to outlive his son, his poor cursed son. And I, that to me was the connecting, the connecting piece between them that, that married those two stories, those two portions for me was just the father character. Um, I don't know. I, I, I find him to be interesting. I don't know why, but I find him to be interesting. You're not the only one. Just go ask Hurin fan on our Discord, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, my last, I think my final thoughts on this chapter were the, just painting the picture of like Aang Bond emptying all of the creature cages or whatever, however they're keeping all the creatures and terrible things that the, I have a quote here. It says there came wolves and wolf riders and there came Balrogs plural and dragons plural and Glaurung father of dragons. The strength and terror of the great worm uh, were now great. In Wait, the strength and terror of the great worm were now great indeed and elves and men withered before him. He came between the hosts of Madros and Fingon and swept them apart. So anyways, I just thought like, not only do you got dragon, you know, big daddy dragon, uh, you've got all of these terrible things coming at you. And it's just like, man, this is wild. I, so anyways, one of my favorite things that I know this is mildly tangential, but one of my favorite things about the Lord of the Rings films is the visuals of the Balrog uh, in Minds of Moria and Fellowship. I, but Ryan, it had wings. Uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> that is the absolute correct response, <laughs> verbatim. Whatever. Uh, but it's that is its scale, its size. It's a genuinely terrifying beast. It's there's so much about it that's fantastic. I love the visuals of it. So when I read this and I picture a mountainside full of those creatures coming charging at men, like. <laughs> That is, I wet my armor, die on the spot. Like n I never get to the battle because that's so terrifying to me. Like I, my heart just bursts in my, in my chest and I fall right. dead right on the spot. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And thanks to Peter Jackson and his team for that visual. But like you can, you can envision them any way you want. Do they necessarily have to be 20 feet tall? Eh, not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's still plenty to be terrifying about them right just from the description we get in this book um but speaking of uh speaking of terrifying stuff i said earlier that this isn't grimdark that tolkien isn't grimdark uh let, let, let me let me walk that back a half a step because we do get this description and this is where like this is his high school grimdark phase where he just <laughs> you know 
you know, people are, are fond of saying that, you know, Tolkien, oh, he's too, he's too bright and cheerful. It's too, like, the good guys win in the end. It's too, like, you know, whatever. It's not George Martin enough, right? But then we get this. It is kind of like a bit of psychological warfare where you've got elves kind of ringing this valley. And a bunch of them are hiding in these hills. And they won't come down because they know that they've got the favorable terrain. You know, I have the, ha <clears throat> the high ground, Anakin, right? So they're not coming down. And the orcs are like, well, we got to do something to bring them down. Uh, and so they haul out, uh, let's see, Gelmir, son of Gwilin, that lord of Nargothrond, whom they had captured uh, in the Bragolach, the fourth battle. So this is the fifth battle. They captured him in the last battle uh, years earlier. And they had blinded him. Then the heralds of Angband showed forth, showed him forth, crying, We have many more such at home, but you must make haste if you would find them, for we shall deal with them all when we return, even so. And they hewed off Gelmir's hands and feet and his head last within sight of the elves and left him. And so then the elves get worked up into this blood frenzy and they charge down the hills and that's kind of like the beginning of this disastrous battle. Um, so, yeah, it... He, he was capable of some dark stuff that we're going to get to with Turin, but even just like in the violence end of things, he's not... He, uh, <laughs> I just got done reading a Matthew Stover book for an author shelf that we're doing later this week. And there's, you know, when somebody gets their head chopped off, there's blood spurting. You know, he's talking about the last heartbeat, you know, flooding the floor with this pool of crimson, blah, 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 whatever. He's not doing that. But this kind of description. They hew off his hands and his feet and his head last. There is no, like, there's no world in which that isn't horrifying. Even if you're not spelling out, you know, how many uh, spurts the heart continues to send through the neck, you know, whatever. Like, does that make sense? Like, this is pretty, and, pretty gruesome stuff. No, it makes perfect sense. And I think we, we've had this conversation before with previous authors. I think Sanderson was an example that I brought up in whatever episode it was a hundred years ago where certain writers like to do that blow by blow, like, like, like paint the picture for you exactly. Mm -hmm. And other writers leave a little bit of that up to your own imagination. My own personal preference is being able to fill in those gaps where you get just enough detail, but your, your mm -hmm. imagination is kind of left to fill in the rest of that where some don't want to do that or some, or that's just their style. Um, Tolkien's very much that he won't linger on the gore. Um, in fact, he rarely will go blow by blow in what's happening, but he definitely gives you a broad perspective and that sense of doom, if you will, that was felt. Um, and you can kind of, as a reader, fill in the, fill in the blanks. And I think in my mind that can be more effective not to say one's necessarily better than the other, but that's my personal preference. I think it can be more effective that way. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's move on then to Turin, because um, that's where I think the bulk of our listener questions came from that. We got a lot of questions, and thank you to everybody for chiming in on Discord. I appreciate that. We're not going to get to everything. It's just not going to happen, but uh, we'll get to as many as we can. But one of the recurring things that came up in the listener questions was the curse. And I will, so the, the curse comes up in chapter 20, before we get to the chapter of Turin Turambar. So this is the end of the fifth battle. The fifth battle has gone badly, right? Um, even Gondolin emptied and sent all of their elves from the hidden city to try to help. Um, and, but it turns out the treachery of some of the humans who had joined in, you know, they like they turn on the elves in the 11th hour and kind of make everything go badly. So the, the battle goes poorly. Middle Earth, or I should say Beleriand, is overrun with uh, orcs in a way that it hasn't been up to this point in the story, um, at least since the Noldor arrived. Um, and Hurin, who is one of the three, he's among the three faithful houses of men, um, he's captured. He's taken back to uh, Angband. And Morgoth, uh, he's trying to use him to figure out where Gondolin is, you know, get some other information on what's going on in Beleriand. And Hurin won't 
do it. He's like, F you, man. I'm not playing your game. You, you know, get out of here. Uh, so then we get at the end of chapter 20, then Morgoth cursed Hurin and Morwen and their offspring and set a doom upon them of darkness and sorrow. So that is where the curse comes in. So now we've got Leviathan on Discord who asks, how much of Turin's bad luck do you think is due to Morgoth's curse versus his own bad choices? Um, Felicity says, do you guys think that most of Turin's misfortunes are because of poor decisions by him or pure bad luck? Um, you know, a few other people brought up, you know, what, what to what can we attribute Turin's bad uh, juju? Uh, throughout this, uh, <laughs> this story. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> and I'll just, I, I'm not going to do a full recap. This is all kind of off the top of my head. You guys can help fill in the gaps. But uh, Turin is a boy during that fifth battle when his father is taken. Um, his mother eventually sends him to uh, uh, King Thingol uh, because they have a connection. And Thingol takes him in as his kind of adopted son. Um, and then he gets insulted by one of the elves there, and he chases that elf into a chasm. The elf dies, and so Turin thinks he's an outlaw. He's got to run away. He joins a band of other outlaws, um, even though Thingol is trying to bring him back and tell him it's okay, all is forgiven. Um, but So he joins a band anyway. of outlaws. What now? I never liked that guy anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he joins a band of outlaws, but then one of his companions, one of his warrior elf companions comes and finds him and is like, no, you should really come back. He won't do it. Um, a bunch of bad stuff <laughs> happens with him and a bunch of dwarves, but he is gaining renown, right? He's, um, he's gaining renown as this warrior and as a leader. And so he ends up in Nargothrond, where the same thing happens. He's gaining renown. He's a war leader. Um, he's kicking orcs' butts all over the place. Um, and the rumor of his uh, battle prowess reaches even Morgoth. Um, and so eventually, he, because of his successes, the elves of Nargothrond get really lazy about their secrecy. Um, and so Morgoth now knows where Nargothrond is, and he sends Glaurung and a whole bunch of orcs, and they sack the whole place. Glaurung puts a spell on Turin's sister so that she forgets absolutely everything, um, including her own name and her lineage, then sends her off. Um, and then, you know, he, he kind of uh, taunts Turin later when he shows up. So Turin then runs away. He ends up finding his sister, falling in love with her. He's never met her, right? She's many years younger than he is. Um, and she doesn't know who he is and she doesn't know who she is. So they fall in love. They get married. She gets pregnant. Um, and then Turin ends up killing the dragon who then lifts the uh, veil of ignorance off of uh, Nienor and she kills herself because of well, for reasons we maybe we can get into. Uh, and then when Turin wakes up from, you know, after having killed the dragon, he wakes up, finds out she killed herself. Uh, and then he's so riddled with shame that he kills himself on his blade. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that happened. But there you go. There's a few broad strokes. Uh, okay. So that being said, uh, uh, the question from Leviathan is, how much of Turin's bad luck do you think is due to Morgoth's curse versus his own bad choices? My question to go along with that is, does Morgoth really have the power to curse Turin? I mean, we, you know, we can all curse. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to because we don't want that explicit rating here. But, you know, we can curse. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily give things power. Does Morgoth have that power, Ryan? I mean, there's a uh, great piece of recent media that uh, I think answers this for us when the hit song, We Don't Talk About Bruno, the lesson that we learned from this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy, honestly. I think it's, yeah. oh, I'm cursed. And uh, because of that, it's, it's interpretation. Is he actually magically cursed to kill people every time things start going good. I, I don't feel like that's the case. I feel like this is, uh, it starts pretty obvious and pretty early where it's, oh, I chased this guy into a chasm. <clears throat> now I have to go and live in the wild uh, with these outlaws. Um, 
again, I, I reference way too many things to much more family friendly things. This is my Simba being chased out into the uh, to meet Timon and Pumbaa moment. Um, <laughs> it's but, basically the same story. See, I mean, if yeah. you think about it, I, I figured see, as much. <laughs> and my references went to like I feel like Turin in this story is the uh, the is it Monty Python where he goes to the wedding and he just starts stabbing everybody. <laughs> I can't remember if it is it Lancelot. I can't remember which I can't remember which night it is. Yeah, where he's uh, at the wedding. <laughs> is it Lancelot who shows yes. up? It's Lancelot. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh! It's so good. And he just starts killing everybody at the wedding party, and then they like get him to calm down, and then he just starts stabbing him again. I'm like, <laughs> that's Turin. And every time he turns around, somebody either pops out of the woods and he kills them, or they accidentally scratch him and he goes into a fit of rage and kills well, them, and then finds out it was his cousin or something like that. <laughs> like ah, that's exactly the I think one of the key points to why I feel like this isn't an actual curse. This is just self fulfilling prophecy. Like there's some part of Turin that knows like. He's just responding poorly just, because just bring it down, man. <laughs> you like he's so yes. There's a moment he's being he's tortured by orcs. Things have gone terribly. He's chained down, whatever. And Beleg comes to save him, and Beleg is cutting his uh, his bonds and nicks his foot with the knife. If I remember right, mm-hmm. nicks mm-hmm. his foot with the knife. You yep. can torture everything, and his immediate response: I've been tortured by orcs. But this guy tickles my foot. This one's going to die now that I'm free. You know, this is what's going to happen. You're like, maybe at some point before you slit a throat or before you stab, you could have heard, just been like, this doesn't feel like an orc or this doesn't, like there there should have been a moment <laughs> for him to I, spot. This is not, this, this isn't who I thought it was before I start stabby stabby. That's, it's interesting. The way you frame that, I'm not sure I'm totally on board with just because, um, if I had spent days being tortured by orcs and, you know, and I was totally out of it, I couldn't see, like, somebody's behind me cutting my bonds. Like, I'm not thinking clearly, you know, yeah. it's, um, so who, uh, D, D, D uh, says, that's the thing. He's very often the victim of exceptionally poor circumstances. <laughs> and that's, so yeah. that's actually something in favor of the idea that this is an actual curse. Like he gets put in situations where, Things like that are bound to happen. Um, so he kills Beleg, thinking that he's an orc. Of course, he's not an orc, but he was being tortured by orcs. And is it really so ridiculous to think that Turin would think, oh my gosh, they're back. You know, he's he's he can't feel him sawing off his bonds, but when, you know, something pokes him in the foot and he's like, oh, I felt that. They're back at it and my hands are free. You're dead. Like you're out of here, you know. That's I. I don't feel like he's. Uh, how do I put this? I'm gonna. I'm gonna actually bring in Nienor as well. Uh, his sister, when he marries her, she gets pregnant, um, and then you know, and then the curse is lifted, and she realizes, and eventually he realizes as well. Like this is a great evil that has been done. However. Just because the thing that happened is evil doesn't mean that he or they could be blamed for it. Yeah. Right? And it's the same thing with Beleg. A great evil has been done, but that doesn't mean he can be blamed for it. Um, I don't know. Does that does that sit all right with you guys? Yeah. I- Turin the blameless. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't... I genuinely wouldn't have a problem with that. I think... Maybe it's something that as it progresses, the it becomes more apparent that it is, you know. Do you think he just got it? Yeah. Do you think at some point he realized like, oh, this crazy stuff happens to me all the time. Now I've got basically this like carte blanche of I can do whatever I want and I'll just blame it on the curse. Like, oh, Beleg, ah, you're dead. Oh, whoops, curse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I I don't think that would be accurate with those shockingly dark moments. Um, sure. But I think that is totally fair if you get into... Um, Sister's kind of cute. Oh, curse. <laughs> <laughs> wow. First of all, wow. That's what uh, I'm here for. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, wow, okay. So what was I saying? I have no idea because that really <laughs> threw me off. No, with the, the smaller things, um, when, when he kills is it diron the the minstrel that he 
or is it Dyron the Minstrel? No, it's somebody else. Anyway, he, he makes him fall off the, the cliff, right? So this is in the beginning of the chapter when he's in Thingol's realm and he chases an elf off the cliff. The elf dies um, and he's like, oh crap, they're going to kill me for sure. Um, and so he runs away. That's a, it, it's, it's a debatable, but certainly a reasonable position to take. <laughs> if they catch me, they'll kill me. I'm out of here. Totally reasonable. When Beleg catches up to him weeks or months later and says, hey, Thingol wants you to come back. You, you know, the story has been told. We know what happened. You're, you are to be pardoned. Come on back. That's one of those moments where Turin has a chance to humble himself and say, you know what? Okay, I'll take my licks. Um, I'll take the dirty looks and you know, just be, and I'll be a better person and I'll go back and, you know, uh, try to right whatever wrongs I've created. But he doesn't do that. And that's what happens throughout the story is it's the, the, how do I, uh, the more depressing moments are the moments when events beyond his control or their control conspire to make horrible, horrible things happen to him and around him. But kind of almost more tragic than that are the times when he has risen above that curse and pulls himself back to it by, by his pride, basically, by saying, no, yeah. I am the master of fates. No, I am the Mormagil. I, you know, you know, I'm the black sword. I'm the whatever. And so, like, right? Does that make sense? Like, it's more tragic because it was his choice in certain yeah. pl places. He sets himself on the well, path knew, of destruction. So Yeah, you knew he done messed up when he named himself Master of Fate. <laughs> like, nah, man. No. Um, yeah. Hey, can I ask you something, Craig? Yeah, go for it. Is this the is this the chapter where where Tolkien finally got lazy with his naming conventions? <laughs> Go on. Because well, no, because let me you, let me bring in a listener question first, or a listener comment first, uh, which is uh, somebody said something about names. I promise it's in here somewhere. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, Meg said favorite names so far. I've bookmarked a few. I think Nerdanel and Mablung are my favorites, although Gothmog I have saved as a future cat name. Mm. So. <laughs> and this and this segues quite nicely because I think it makes my point of him just getting lazy with a particular name. We've got Nagrond, we've got Melian, we've got Beleg, we've got all these crazy names. And then you got Nathan. <laughs> we just got Nathan. I just read that. I was actually listening to it and it was like, I think it was like Bella and Turin, all these like names. And then the narrator was like, Nathan, the wronged. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like, oh, but spell it funny. You got to spell it funny. That's yeah, spell it funny. That's yeah. He was probably from like, I don't know, Southern or, you know, Provo area, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw a couple of E's and I's in there. So, oh, my gosh. Um, if anybody wants a real laugh, I think we might have even mentioned this on the show before. Go just Google Utah names and, you know. It's, you'll have a good time. Okay. Uh, okay, so names on this one. Yeah, that sort of thing is bound to happen. There's no way that he could fully avoid slightly silly sounding names uh, when he's making up a, a, a language. Oh, no, I'm, I'm just saying the normal name. I'm saying he had all these silly sounding names, which just mean he was putting in effort. And then he got lazy because he was like, that's, like, this is a placeholder I, name where he I, was like, <laughs> Thingol, um, Silmarillion, um, Dimbar. Yeah, that's a good one. Ah, shoot. I got one more. This guy's going to be wronged. Uh, I'll just put Nathan for now and I'll come back to this later. He went to, he went to use the find function and it, yeah. it was misspelled. Yeah. Uh, Cause that was a thing that he had back then was a find function. <laughs> Dude, that's right. On his typewriter in his garage. Um, see now, now I want some sort of skit where there's all these like, all these characters, super fantastical characters, and then it's just Nathan, and they all share a <laughs> share a flat together. It, it, it could Come on, be, Nate, we're gonna go kill Morgoth. It could be uh, a great Turin moment, though. It, it could just be one of those things like he's about to declare something. You know, uh, he's he's just joined the outlaws. And he's got I got to come up with a name, and he's like, I do got to uh, 
Yeah, Nate, no, nah, Nathan, Nate, oh, damn it, Nathan. I guess that's what I am. I'm Nathan. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Sure, it sounds a little silly, especially if you're doing the audiobook. If you're reading it, it's really not such a big deal um, because it is spelled elvishly, elven, elvenly. Um, but this sort of thing happens all the time. So he's got. Uh, well, there's there's Ryan's all time favorite character name, ever. Fatty Bulger. Fatty Bulger, <laughs> there like, you know, <laughs> so, that was my nickname in prison. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> He's not thinking about that crap. Similarly, there is a word or a name in Elvish uh, that you guys are gonna love. It's teleporno. Um, <laughs> things. I like usually watch with happen. the audio off, so I don't need the Spanish translation. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i don't know whatever there's there's some funny names in there They're perfectly fine by me um but yeah that is a good one from meg who you know gothmog would be a great name for a cat especially if it was like a black cat that you could just call goth um that'd be great i love yeah. it i love it um okay so we got some more questions from eleanor uh eleanor says all right here's my question what do you guys think of the friendship of Turin and Beleg? Um, and then a second question. Let's see. Some say that if Kurfin and Keligorm, um, let's see, didn't. Oh, and, and I apologize. I believe Eleanor is Chinese. And so I'm trying to, uh, you know, English is not um, her, her first language. So uh, some say that if Kurfin and Keligorm had not done the make Luthien marry Keligorm thing, the fifth battle would have had more elves to join the good side and elves might have won. What do you think? Okay, so a couple of things to chew on there. Kelegorm and Kurufin, maybe we get to that, but what do you guys think of the friendship of Turin and Beleg? Let's start there. Um, we've had now a romance between an uh, elf and a human, but now we have like a, a friendship. Did that, did that satisfy you uh, it seems like a lot of the friendship stuff happened off stage until it was like hey by the way we're best friends and we've been best friends forever um yeah did you guys buy it did you like it yeah i was i'm good with it i it's predecessor to the uh frodo sam relationship type setup mm -hmm. i think uh honestly which I, is interesting because it's the elf in the sam role right yeah um but i I don't know. I didn't need a whole lot of believable run up as to why they were best friends and, you know, how they played catch when they were little. And I didn't need any of that. I was very much just a, uh, it was the decision when, when Beleg stayed after telling, uh, Turin that, uh, no, you can come back. And he says, no, I'm not going to. And he says, well, then I'm going to stay with you. That moment is all I needed to cement the, what that relationship was and that how, how strong Beleg felt, uh, feels for towards Turin. And how much Turin respects Beleg, uh, you know, in, in vouching for him with the outlaws and everything, I I didn't need a ton for, it, and it was still very impactful when we get to the dark part of Turin killing Beleg and being like, oh no, this the love that Beleg had for him and that he came after him to save him and things like that. Like there's there's plenty there uh, for me in terms of uh, loving that that uh, relationship between the two of them. Hmm. Yeah. Kyle, any other thoughts? Should we move on to another question? No, I mean, I, I feel like we don't necessarily need the backstory. I'm perfectly fine with it being fairly stated. Like these two had a strong bond because they'd been through some stuff together um, and not spending too much screen time on it. So I thought it was perfectly fine. And I, I felt like there was still enough weight to Ryan's point. There was enough weight uh, behind the relationship that when he accidentally kills him, it was like, Oh crap, that sucks. Mm, so. Yeah. Well, let's go to something else then. Um, and that's the dragon. Okay. Glaurung. We've met Glaurung in his like adolescent form, but now it's Glaurung. He's, you know, the, the Lord of dragons or whatever he called. I can't remember. Uh, but this one comes from Deepolt, who says, Glaurung is not just a fire-breathing lizard. He is a hyper-intelligent being, a master manipulator, and has some form of psychic ability. Did this catch anyone else off guard? Smaug was intelligent, but he was not this. Uh, and then he adds, also, er, he says, something about Glaurung really disturbs me. 
How'd you guys like the dragon in this one? Glaurung is great. He's fantastic. And uh, this is one of the few uh, villain stories where like, I was, I don't want to say that I was glad because I, that feels wrong to say, but mm-hmm. there's a, a a payoff to him kind of getting the last laugh with Turin in the end. Like, even though that eventually, yeah, he, I'm dying. I'm, I'm going to die out of this. But everything that I said was going to happen, every part of the doom that's been pronounced upon you, I've been able to achieve. So I win. I die, but I win. Um, it's, I don't know, it, it was just good. It was good. I, I think Glaurung fills a more satanic role in this story in some ways than, uh, than Morgoth does. Mm. So Morgoth fills that role kind of mythologically, like he, like the place that Satan fills in Christian mythology, like that is, okay, that's Morgoth. Great. But then we get to kind of what you're talking about, Ryan. Um, like you can kill me, but I still win that kind of attitude. So there's, um, it, the, the common thing you hear, you know, you go to Sunday school often enough and you hear like the devil will tell you a hundred loot, a uh, hundred truths just to get you to believe one lie. Right. We've all heard that little nostrum before. So when Turin shows up at, after the sack of Nargothrond, um, and there's Glaurung waiting for him. Um, let's see, let's see for, oh, that's right. And he, he freezes, like he uses his magic powers, whatever, to freeze Turin in place. And Turin has to watch fully conscious as they march all of these slaves out of Nargothrond. You know, they, they've taken all these prisoners of war, including the woman that he actually loves. He, he's in love with an elf woman and he's watching her get taken off. Uh, super, super disturbing scene. But Glaurung spoke again, taunting Turin, and he said, Evil have been all thy ways, son of Hurin. Thankless fosterling, outlaw, slayer of thy friend, thief of love, usurper of Nargothrond, captain foolhardy, and deserter of thy kin. As thralls, thy mother and thy sister live in Dorloman in misery and want. And it's, it's kind of that formulation where everything he says, at least from a certain point, a certain point of view, right, Ryan? Mm-hmm. At least everything he says from a certain point of view is true. Thankless fosterling, outlaw, slayer of thy friend, thief of love, usurper of Nargothron, captain foolhardy, and deserter of thy kin. You go back through the story and it's like, yes, 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 yes. Turin is all of those things. Um, and it's obviously a very uncharitable <laughs> uh, version of Turin up to this point, but uh, but logical, defensible, reasonable, a reasonable way to look at him. And then he says, as thralls thy mother and thy sister live in Dorloman in misery and want. That is not true. That is meant simply to drive Turin to do something stupid, uh, which is exactly what he does. He then goes to Dorloman, kills a whole bunch of people, you know, from his former household, etc. cetera. Um, and so in that way, Glaurung feels more satanic in the, like the zoomed in narrative that we're getting than Morgoth does, you know, in our 30,000 foot view that we get through the rest of the book. See that? Yeah. Kyle, you I mean, look like he, you were about to say something. Well, I actually had marked that same quote that you read, so I appreciate that you read that through because I thought it was one of the standouts of this part. But I really like the commentary that that Glaurung probably facilitates the role of Satan in this story. Um, he's literally a serpent, and mm-hmm. he's literally just like your comparison to him and Smaug like the differences between him and Smaug, they're both very intelligent, but, but Smaug was very much more boastful and self aggrandizing. Like this is how amazing I am where Glaurung is really just a matter of like what you read. He's picking apart Turin and um, he's not, he's not saying words to like to boost himself up the way that Smaug would, but in the, in the, putting down of Turin, it puts them at this different uh, levels of power, I guess. 
Um, and like I said, he literally is a serpent in this, in this regard. Um, that whispering voice of, of uh, self-loathing mm. is what he does. So I thought it's a, it's a really interesting portrayal. And then at the very end, what does he say when he's after Turin stabs him and he's dying and he lifts the curse and he, he says something to, Oh, what's her name? The sister. Neonor. Yeah. I can't remember exactly, but I'll see if I can find it. Cause the way that he says um, something about like the betrayal of, of Turin and that she'll feel it. Um, I can't remember exactly. Uh, what it was, yeah. But basically he reveals when he reveals that, their brother and sister, and she's pregnant with his child. Right. So. He says, uh, uh, Glaurung stirred for the last time ere he died, and he spoke with his last breath, saying, Hail, Neonor, daughter of Hurin. Oh, no, you're talking about when he's talking to, to Turin? Or when he's talking to Neonor? No, Neonor at the okay. very end, yeah. And he says, we, met, uh, we meet again ere the end. I give thee joy that thou hast found thy brother at last. And now thou shalt know him, a stabber in the dark, treacherous to foes, faithless to friends, and a curse unto his kin, Turin, son of Hurin, but the worst of all his deeds thou shalt feel in thyself. Yeah. Oh, man, that dude is evil. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and the fact that he he opens that with, I give thee, what do you say? Give thee I give joy thee joy that, that thou hast yeah. found thy brother at last. Yeah, Amazing. that irony there, and yeah, it's just very sinister. Yeah. Loved it. Oh, man, so good, so good, and so bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you guys know me. You know that I, uh, I I adore Tolkien and all of these books, and I, you know, I've read them religiously, almost literally, since you know I was like 17. But that doesn't mean that Tolkien's perfect. Uh, as a writer or a storyteller. And there was something that finally caught up with me. I, I, I have this thought every now and then, but on this read through of the Silmarillion, it, it took me until this chapter to finally go, all right, enough. Can Just enough. And that is Tolkien's um, tendency to use superlatives for everybody that we meet. Uh, and so what I mean by that is, uh, let's see. We're in chapter 21. We're talking about Beleg. Uh, let's see. Beleg departed from Amon Ruth and set out northward. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and not even in the dreadful woods of Tarnufuin did he swerve from the trail, for the skill of Beleg was greater than any that have been in Middle Earth. And this is something that comes up all the time, right? So, uh, you know. Baron's fate was greater than any of the, you know, in all of the history of Middle Earth. Uh, you know, Luthien is the most lovely of any, and Galadriel's hair was the most golden of anything that has ever been seen in, you know, in all of our days. He does this all the time. The superlatives get a little bit wearing, where it's like, not everybody has to be the most X, you know, or the best Y, whatever. So I don't know, just one of those little things. I thought I would air that. <laughs> just say that sometimes I do get annoyed by that. It, it's okay but to it's have... But it's got to be epic, Craig. Uh, I guess so. This is this is the epic of Tolkien's mythos, so everything's got to be epic and super grand. The best of the best. Um, the, the one, as I was thinking about this, because it really did, it annoyed me. It stopped me and made me do, just like, oh gosh. I like wrote it down in my book. Can we stop? Um, the one defense I can muster is that he's telling the, the most epic stories in the history of Middle Earth, right? And so because mm-hmm. that's the case, I suppose a lot of these people are going to be the most this, that, or the other. <sighs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but as I'm reading it, I still get a little annoyed. So that's all. Yeah. I mean, I think that's not far off from probably the truth is he's telling the epic stories or the mythos and you look at norse you know look at the mighty thor who is mightier than everybody else or you read beowulf and you've got him being the greatest warrior or whatever so like i'd compare it to those where that's just kind of the nature of these epic of these epics i should say Mm -hmm. but it does get tiresome especially when you're reading it over and over again about 
it, dare I say it gets a little Trumpy, the, the best thing ever. You know, like, anyway, I tell the most epic stories. Yeah, that's so. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's I, the, I just probably and that's the most yeah. he will ever appear on any of our podcasts. So. I just cut cut to Craig's soul by comparing <sighs> Tolkien to I, Trump. Yeah, Sorry, everybody. Uh, moving on. Wow. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I don't want to dwell. Let's not dwell on that. Uh, where, where, where are we? We got a, we did get a lot of great questions. Uh, so Jesse L, uh, Barely, Meg, Deepold sent in a lot of great questions. Uh, maybe we can address a lot of the, a lot more of these later. Um, but I do want to come back. I've got two more things I want to talk to you guys about before we wrap this up and call it a, a day or a night, whatever, whatever we're calling this. Um, the first one is I want to loop back to the, the curse. Okay. And just ask now that we've talked about it a bunch, we've talked about the, uh, the story and some of the characters in it and some of the events in it barely asks, uh, or says the story of Kulervo that Turin heavily draws on doesn't have an explicit curse at all beyond the curse of a bad upbringing or terrible childhood. Not sure if I prefer that or an actual curse, quote unquote, actual curse, However, I definitely get why a fantasy writer would want to include one, especially due to the role Morgoth plays in the world. Um, so I just, I'm just i bringing this back up to say, do you guys have any further thoughts? I, I feel like this is our central question. Is the curse real? Do we want to come down one way or another at now at the end of this episode? Is it a curse or is it pride? Is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? I, I know I already hit on it before, but our, the discussion has adjusted my view a little bit i think a lot of times we look at the the critical moments the 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 deaths and the different moments as oh this is the curse this is the the curse but i think those are the consequences of the self-fulfilling prophecy that moment earlier where you talked about he makes a decision at some point along the way that then leads to the consequence of this and that is the curse is that his choice earlier on to not return or his cho- his choice to do whatever puts him on the path that eventually the curse will play off will pay off. So it's it's self fulfilling prophecy when he makes the choice, but it's a real curse that once that choice is made, this it will lead to the consequence that mm. is deeper and darker than what we what mm. uh, we might expect. Yeah, I'd agree with that, and I'd add to it that it's it's self fulfilling in the way that it's a psychological state of mind. I think in a lot of ways where it's, I mean, look at what Glaurung just said to him when he's beating him down with all the, like all the terrible things that he is. And Turin knows that. And if he's reminding himself of that or thinking in that way, it's kind of that idea that you attract your thoughts, attract what you, or you attract what you what you think about kind of idea. And so if, if I say I'm, I'm really bad at remembering names, I'm not going to remember anybody's names when I meet them. If I say, I'm cursed and all things bad are going to happen to me, then I'm going to look for the bad things and I'm going to be in, to your point, I'm going to be in those, uh, those situations where bad things are more likely to happen to me. So I think it doesn't have to be magical to be a real curse. That's exactly what I was going to go to. Yeah, no, I think like you, Ryan, I my thinking has actually adjusted a little bit during this conversation because you know we I think the way that it was framed in some of the earlier earlier questions is basically was this magic or is it all Turin's fault? But that's not like neither of those have to be true, right? It's a, I, not necessarily magic. Like Morgoth can't make somebody make horrible decisions, right? But he can capitalize on somebody's horrible decisions. Or he can, like with Glaurung, Glaurung, um, he manipulates and drives Turin and Nienor toward these, uh, you know, that, that fate at the end of the story. It's, you know, they had to make certain decisions to be put in that situation. And then when, the, when they're in that situation, they have to make certain decisions, whatever. Um, but Glaurung plays an active role in it. Morgoth plays an active role. He's a little more in the background in this story, but still, they're you know they're doing things to make their lives miserable, um, 
And so it's right. It's it's not magic, but it's still malevolent. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not just because Turin is a, a horrible person or a bad judge of character or whatever. Like, yeah, he does make horrible decisions, but that doesn't mean he's he's the only one making horrible decisions. So. Yeah. It, it, if you take this story and you change one decision, it has a major domino effect on everything else. Like if he goes back, his sister doesn't have to come find him. They don't end up in an incestuous relationship. Like I'm sure Morgoth figures out some other way to torment them, but you know, yeah, it's any one of those decisions change alters a huge mm-hmm. portion of this story. Yeah. All right. So, uh, final question. We're going to make this our, uh, closing question for the day. This one from Sir Ravis who asks, do you find the end of Turin Turambar satisfying? <laughs> Are stories with unhappy endings generally satisfying? And, it, you know, if so, how so? Uh, yeah, how, how, like, did this leave you guys feeling hollow and empty inside? Or did did you really enjoy the story? Every... Uh, or por que no los dos, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could maybe both. Everything paid off. Like, I don't feel like there's anything left undone. So in that sense, it is satisfying, but maybe it's like ending a nice meal on your least favorite part of the plate, like your like the vegetable you don't like <laughs> or whatever is the last thing you taste, and that's the taste in your mouth. You know, it, you're satisfied, you got everything you need out of it, but it's there's just it would have been nicer to have that one that sweet flavor. Uh, but sure, you know, falling on a sword, that's fine, that's fine, I'm good with it. Kyle. Yeah, I don't think it has to be a happy ending to be a satisfying ending. To Ryan's point, I think everything um, everything wrapped up in a satisfying way as far as it was, it was true to the life of, of Turin. I think that if all of a sudden the curse was lifted and he walked off into the sunset or whatever, I feel like that would have cheapened the experience of that story, because I don't think that that's the point of this story. So he couldn't live up to his uh, name of Nathan, the wronged if he hadn't, (laughs) (laughs) he could not have, he would have been Nathan, the right. I don't know, but no, I don't, I don't think that's the point of this story. And I don't think that's what we're supposed to take from this story. And I think we're, we're supposed to ask the questions that have been asked is, is it the, the, is it, God and the universe that's against me, or is it my own, uh, my own self that is causing all of the thing, all of these horrible things in my life? And mm-hmm. I think that you can be a victim of circumstance and still be able to um, respond to those circumstances positively or negatively. And I think that that's kind of the takeaway, at least for me here, is that life sucks. And you could, you like Turin just experienced a lot of really terrible situations. I think it's true to life that we all experience different things. Like maybe we don't accidentally kill our friends when he jumps out of the bushes, but like we all have our own instances of, of bad things that happen to us and circumstances that like, I think you made the point earlier that like, it's not our fault necessarily. It doesn't mean that it's any less crappy. Hmm. Um, but it's how you respond to it. And I think at, at a certain point I look at this and, and Turin, the, 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 whatever veil is lifted and he realizes like, Oh, we've done a horrible, horrible thing. And he falls on his sword. He finally makes the choice to just end it that way. So I don't know. Um, uh, I don't. I don't necessarily have a ton to add to that, but I will go back to something you both said, which is that this story felt complete. I would agree with that. However, there is one loose end that is still uh, unanswered, and that is what happened to Hurin. So, Hurin, when last we left him, was alive and chained to a chair on a mountaintop with magical sight, so that he could see everything that happened to his children. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the story, you know, we, we haven't heard. Well, we're going to hear. That's your tease for what's coming up. Uh, Morgoth is not through messing with Hurin. Um, and uh, that's going to carry us into our next uh, batch of chapters. 
in this book. It's, I, I told you guys before we did Baron and Luthien, I was like, you know, a lot of this stuff, take it or leave it, you know, love it and hate it, whatever. But for 18 chapters, it was basically set up and then it's like dominoes just start falling. Everything is happening. Things are going completely nuts. That's, we're in the middle of that right now. Like we've had two kind of nice self-contained stories, but we're we're going to kind of continue with that. Like actual characters that we have gotten to know, uh, gotten to maybe enjoy, sympathize with, whatever. Um, and we're going to be following those for the next few chapters. Mm -hmm. And things are... There's going to be a lot of a lot of heroism and a lot of uh, well crappy stuff happening to good mm. people. So, so tune in next week for Hurin Harambe. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! <laughs> uh, all right. Well, thanks guys I'm proud for of you, Kyle. I'm proud of you. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ryan. I I hate both of you, and I hope that's all right. It's um, okay. I hope that's acceptable. So yeah, everybody else, thanks for listening. Go to thelegendarium.com for all the reasons I mentioned before. Um, and also, I mean, by the time this comes out, eh, maybe it'll come out tomorrow. Um, we do still have room for you if you're in or around Portland on May 28th. Uh, let me know. Go to thelegendarium.com, click on Legendarium Con in the, uh, the menu up top, and you'll find some info about that. We'd love to see you there. Otherwise... Guys, I'll see you, um, I don't know, maybe in a week. we got to catch back up to our schedule. We're still a week behind on our schedule. At some point, we'll catch back up to it for the last, you know, sometime in the last three episodes. <laughs> and uh, whenever it is, I'll, uh, I'll talk to you guys then. 